our allotment. You will notice the recording just popped up. We are recording this um, both for uh, Professor Bennett Shelton, but also for the History Department. It has a wonderful YouTube page if you haven't checked it out already, and for our virtual library on the alumni and parents section of the website. Uh, all of our programming, uh, most of our programming is recorded and available cmt.edu slash alumni, cmt.edu slash parents, and click on the virtual library. You can also review all of the upcoming programming. We're very fortunate this semester not only have the programming that the alumni and parent office is putting together in conjunction with our colleagues in advancement and the many amazing uh, professors and institutes at the college, but also access to Athenaeum programming. So hopefully you've seen our emails on Sunday or you go to the website. We are welcoming our alumni and our parent community uh, to the Athenaeum for the first time virtually ever. Uh, and we're very excited to have that and hope you can join us tonight at five o'clock is Peter Rice, who's one of the, uh, the chair people at uh, Walt Disney Company, the chairman of the television division, uh, speaking with our students, um, faculty, staff, alumni, and parents. So it should be very fun. Uh, I am gonna mute everybody right now, just so uh, we don't hear any background noise. But of course, we'll ask you to unmute if you wanna ask a question later on. A few things about Zoom at the bottom, there's a chat button and a participant button. If you press either of those two, a screen will pop open to the right. Uh, in the chat feature, you can put your name, your class year, your parent year, say a quick hello. City state, it's kind of fun to see where everyone's from. Um, you can also, as we hit the Q&A portion, if you'd like me to ask a question on your behalf, go ahead and put a question into the chat. I'll be watching it, so will my colleague Jenna, and then we will be able to ask your question directly to Professor Bennett Shelton. Um, conversely, if you wanna ask directly, uh, and, um, and be featured uh, for your question, just raise your hand by hitting the raise hand button in the participant section. Um, and if you have any issues, you can just send us a note um, as well. Finally, top right, speaker view and gallery view. You have options on how you want to view today. If you um, want to just see the speaker, make sure you're on speaker view. That means you pretty much just see me right now with a few little boxes of other people at the top. If you want gallery view, which is what I prefer, because I like to see as many faces as possible, uh, I currently have five five rows at, uh, across and six rows deep of uh, screens and names, and that's just my preference. So whatever you want to do, you can choose your own adventure there. Uh, Professor Bennett Shelton will be sharing her screen. Uh, so at some point, your screen will change. Have no fear. It will go back to its regularly scheduled programming uh, once uh, Professor Shelton, Bennett Shelton has ended her presentation. Um, but just be aware that that is uh, available. Therefore, both the recording and the, the, um, the presentation will be available um, in about a day or two on, on our website. So thank you all for being here. We're of course in a very unusual virtual world here at Claremont McKenna College. We thank all of our alumni and parents and friends for their incredible support of this institution. Uh, we can't do all that we do to support our students and our faculty without the incredible support of all of you, whether it's with your time and your volunteerism, your talents and your expertise, or your incredible philanthropic contribution to the Alumni Fund, the Parents Fund, and the Legacy Partners. Um, our, our hearts go out to you. We we'll really appreciate the, uh, the sentiment and all the efforts that you're doing right now. So a big thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Tamara Bennett Shelton. Uh, Tamara has been a professor with us since 2012 after a four year stint uh, at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, she is uh, an expert in, in uh, Chinese medicine. And she, when we talked about um, a presentation, she has a new book coming out, and hopefully, you were able to pick up a copy on Amazon and peruse before. Um, before our program today, but if not, absolutely no worries. Uh, her, her recent book is called Herbs and Roots, A History of Chinese Medicine in the American Medical Marketplace. And we're thrilled that that is the topic of our conversation today, although I'm sure Professor Bennett Shelton would take any questions later on you have uh, that, is, that is relevant to her work. So Professor, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Evan. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Give me a moment. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. It really is a delight to be here with you all. I'm coming to you from my office on the second floor of Kravis. Um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to have a chance to uh, discuss the book with you, my most recent book, which came out uh, last fall in November of 2019 and what feels like about a million years ago at this point. Um, so what I'll do is really just um, give you a kind of overview of what's in the book. Um, I'll spend about maybe 20, 25 minutes 
uh, describing it to you. And then I would be really delighted to field any questions that you might have <coughs> about the history of Chinese medicine in the United States. I'm not a practitioner of Chinese medicine, so don't ask me if it works, but I'm happy to talk about the, the social history of it. Okay, so away we go. Now, I think for many Americans, when we think of traditional Chinese medicine and its history in this country, we tend to think about something like this, right? Acupuncture and the nationwide frenzy for it in the 1970s. But of course, acupuncture is just one of many traditional Chinese therapies and its discovery, or I would argue its rediscovery in the 1970s is actually the end point of my book and not its beginning. Chinese medicine has a very long history in this country. It dates all the way back to the colonial period. It extends up to the present. Um, it, it begins long before there was mass migration from China. Um, before there was mass migration from China, Chinese Materia Medica moved across the oceans in both directions, going from China here and here to China. And then in the 1850s, as the first waves of Chinese immigrants began coming to America, doctors were among them. Now, there were a wide range of healing practices um, in China, but really up until the 1970s, immigrant doctors tended to come from a middling class of merchant physicians who learned diagnosis by pulse or pulsology and herbalism in family businesses. Now back home, uh, if they practiced back home, they would have specialized in making a single proprietary remedy, but abroad they had to become generalists. They had to become general practitioners. So Chinese herbalists in the United States um, ended up diagnosing and treating all manner of ailments. Um, some of them became bone setters. Some of them became um, specialists in midwifery or delivering babies or even providing abortions. Chinese doctors in America served both Chinese and non-Chinese patients. They advertised their services in English and Spanish language newspapers. And I'm showing this um, image. This is one of the images from my book. Um, this is one of my favorite sources, which is a trade card from, as it says here, 1880. This was a Chinese herbalist who practiced in Los Angeles. And this trade card is at the Huntington Library in San Marino. If you flip it over on the other side, which is very badly water damaged, you can see he has his, the services that he provided listed in English and then Spanish below it. Um, so over time, Chinese medicine, along with other, other medical knowledge systems deemed irregular or alternative, both facilitated and undermined the consolidation of Western style medical science. So this is really what my book is about. It chronicles um, roughly 200 years of the history of Chinese medicine in the United States. It's a history of transplantations and transformations. Um, it's a history of American medicine, its professionalization and its regulation, and it's also a history of Chinese immigrant life. Now, I began researching and writing this book while I was teaching in Oregon, uh, my first job out of graduate school, which was at Reed College. And just about anyone who lives in Oregon eventually becomes familiar with this fellow, Dr. Ng He. From 1888 to 1948, Ing He sold traditional Chinese remedies at this really quite remarkable apothecary pictured here on the right called Kamwa Chang. Um, this is a located, it still is in, is in existence, although it's no longer operating as a business. It's located way out in Eastern Oregon in the town of John Day, a very rural, very impoverished part of the state. Um, Here's a picture of Ing He, a little older, um, talking on his front porch with one of his patients. When he was too elderly to continue living on his own, too infirm to run his business, his nephew, who was also an herbalist, um, moved him out to a nursing home in Portland. And then the nephew closed the door on this apothecary and locked it and walked away. He left everything behind, just you know, kind of sitting there gathering dust for nearly 30 years. 
Then in the 1970s, um, the state took it over. Uh, they assumed control of the property, and when they opened it up, it, it was like finding, you know, Tutankhamun's tomb. It was this sort of treasure trove of historical artifacts, you know, tins and jars, boxes of remedies, um, the company records, personal papers, letters that were exchanged to and from Ing He and his patients, um, a lot of personal effects. So today, the Kamwa Chang is a state heritage site. Um, it's an archive, it's a museum. Uh, and Ing He has been the subject of an award-winning documentary um, that aired on Oregon Public Broadcasting. So I became aware of Ing He while living in Oregon and, um, you know, like any good social historian would, I began to wonder, you know, were there others like him? Um, you know, how many Chinese doctors practiced in the United States? Who, where were they? You know, what did they do? Um, and more broadly, I really wanted to understand what their lived experiences could tell us about their time and their place. So, you know, I, I started this project kind of thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll find enough for an article. But it turns out that Chinese doctors were everywhere. Everywhere there were Chinese people, there were Chinese doctors. They were in every state of the Union, as well as Canada and Mexico. But unsurprisingly, they were more numerous in places where Chinese immigrants concentrated. So we're talking California and the American West. They were a, a small but significant cohort. Chinese doctors, as I mentioned earlier, they were part of those first waves of mass immigration uh, from China that began in the 1850s. They came right along with other immigrants from their country. But then after 1850, in any given year, there were probably only about, um, probably no more than 200 full-time practitioners of Chinese medicine working in the United States. Um, that being said, they assumed an outsized importance in their community. They were, of course, healthcare providers. Um, they were also educators. They trained their children and extended families, uh, family members in traditional practices. This is the image from the cover of the book. And it's one that I really love because you can see here um, in, in, in peeking out through the doorway, a child. Um, and, and this image to me and others like it really emphasizes the fact that these were family businesses. They were often multi-generational families working together. And businesses like this one provided essential services, especially at a time when mainstream medical care was not an option for many Chinese immigrants. But not all the work they did was strictly medical. Chinese apothecaries were recreational and religious centers. They were post offices. A Chinese herbalist might serve as his community's uh, banker, their translator, their labor broker. They uh, sponsored new arrivals. They extended charity whenever possible. And after Chinese exclusion barred the entry of working class Chinese, some Chinese doctors did participate in the forgery and smuggling networks that allowed their countrymen to circumvent immigration restrictions. So my sources for this project were fairly eclectic. Um, you know, archival research is really the bread and butter of what historians do, but there are actually very few archives or museums that um, collect, uh, deliberately collect uh, the records of Chinese herbalists practicing in the United States. So I turned then very fairly quickly, fairly quickly exhausted what was available in that respect, and I turned to things like archaeological records, um, newspaper and travel accounts, court cases. Um, a lot of Chinese herbalists got arrested and, and ended up in court. Um, but a lot of what I had to do, what I had to work with rather, were print advertisements. Print advertisements in um, English, in Chinese, and to a lesser extent in Spanish. Now this um, is the earliest example I found of a Chinese doctor advertising his services in the United States. Um, so here you can see at the bottom, I've highlighted the date, whoops, uh, April 11th, 1799. In April of 1799, this advertisement ran in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania newspaper. A man identifying himself as Chinese doctor, Dr. John Howard, announced that he was seeing patients at his home on Second Street. Howard claimed that he'd come from Canton, and he promised to treat a range of ailments with herbs and roots he'd imported from there. 
His advertisements ran in the Harrisburg newspaper throughout the spring and early summer of 1799, and then he moved to Carlisle, which wasn't far away, and advertised in its paper through the fall of 1800. So I believe that John Howard was the first practitioner of Chinese medicine in the United States, and at least the first one to advertise his services in English. But who was he? Was he even in fact Chinese, right? We, we do know that Chinese men and women traveled abroad and sometimes at great distances prior to 1800. They tended to go to Europe, to India, um, to other parts of Asia, as well as Mexico and Hawaii. But relatively few Chinese migrants went to the United States or um, the British colonies that would become the United States. Their presence there went unrecorded until the 1810s when a few um, religious students and domestic servants start appearing in the written record. So this guy, John Howard, if he were in fact Chinese, um, if he was in fact Chinese, would have preceded those men's arrival by more than a decade. John Howard um, very well could have been an American pseudonym that he adopted because it was more easily pronounced and remembered by his English speaking clientele and it's something that later generations of herbalists very often did. They, they'd take a different name because it was um, easier for their, their non-Chinese patients to remember. The truth is I know very little about him. John Howard um, may not have been Chinese at all. He, he may simply have been someone who spent significant time in China, either as a foreign merchant or as a missionary. He doesn't appear in the 1800 census for either Harrisburg or Carlisle, Pennsylvania, nor does he appear in other public records, aside from a very few references here and there in newspapers and a medical journal. When a Connecticut newspaper made note of him, they announced the opening of his business in 1800, it listed the many diseases and afflictions he cured and it praised his abilities. It called him um, a descendant of Galen and Hippocrates. But the announcement did not say anything at all about his nativity. And that was something that was surprising to me. Um, and, and you know, in the book, I kind of speculate as to the meanings of that. But one thing I will say here is, if he was in fact Chinese, this Connecticut newspaper did not think it was important enough to mention. And the idea that someone in South Central Pennsylvania would be practicing Chinese medicine in 1800 was not very surprising because by 1800, 50 years before mass immigration from China to the United States began, Americans were to varying degrees already quite familiar with Chinese medicine. Americans in the colonial period and the early Republic descended from a European world with a fascination um, for all things Chinese, including traditional medicine. And in early America, among the educated elite, there was a great appetite for information about China, its philosophy, its history, and also its medical practices. So I have this very early example of print, print advertising for Chinese medicine, and then I don't have anything for a long time, not really until um, the second half of the 19th century when I see Chinese herbalists increasingly advertising in English language, newspapers and journals and the like. So in the second half of the 19th century, Chinese herbalists began to borrow advertising strategies from makers of patent or proprietary remedies. Um, these included things like traditional display advertisements in newspapers, longer advertising forms like um, booklets, promotional booklets, and, and these are my favorites, trade cards like these. Um, these are from Kam Wa Chung. Chinese doctors particularly targeted non-Chinese women, both English and Spanish speaking women in their advertisements. Throughout the 19th century, um, American women were both major consumers and practitioners of irregular medicine. The American popular press often portrayed women as overly susceptible to what they called oriental quackery. But the press really failed to recognize the ways in which Western style medical science failed to meet the needs of its female patients. Chinese medicine very likely appealed to women on many levels. Um, the distance and discretion offered by Chinatown offices may have been important for some, but perhaps more importantly, it was the prevalence of 
herbal remedies and non-invasive procedures in Chinese medicine that may have been attracted to, attractive to women who were otherwise facing the prospect of really dangerous um, and painful gynecological surgeries. So business cards um, like these from the 1910s, um, advertising Kamwa Chung, aimed to sell not only, as it says here, medical herbs, groceries, Chinese goods, and general merchandise, but also a kind of um, vision of modern, affluent femininity. So you see each card portrays a different white woman. We've got Mildred here kind of playfully tipping her hat. Um, Margaret in the center looks quite regal in this kind of draped robes and her upswept hair. And then Clara who's um, posing in a fur trimmed coat. These were not images of the Eastern Oregon ranching wives who patronized Kao Mua Chung, but maybe they were representations of what they aspired to be. Now, aside from print advertising, my other major sources for this project were oral histories with the American-born children of Chinese herbalists. Um, these are the parents of one of my interviewees. Um, their names are Chan Du Sung and Aster Lee. Um, and their daughter, Anna Dawn, who lives in Tucson, Arizona, and who um, I was actually giving a talk to, uh, for her, her um, Chinese American Association in, 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 in Tucson last week. Um, she um, very generously donated her family's um, business papers to the Claremont College's library. So they are now uh, processed and available for research, researchers to use um, forever. It's really great. So Anna Dawn's parents, Chan Ju Sung and Astor Lee, opened and operated a series of Chinese apothecaries, kind of like McDonald's style. They were franchises. They were all over the American West in the early 20th century. And I have, you know, a handful of other um, families just like that, this one, who um, really gave very generously of their time and very often of their own personal papers. Now, as I began to locate Chinese doctors in the historical record, I became interested in the ways that their stories intersected with the history of American medicine more broadly. So while Herbs and Roots, while the book begins in the late 18th century and it ends in the near present, its principal concern really lies in the late 19th and early 20th century. So a period that historians call the long progressive era. This was a really critical time for the history of the Chinese and the, in, the, in America and the history of medicine in the United States. Um, you might recall that in 1882, Congress passed its first Chinese Exclusion Act, which, which prohibited working class Chinese from entering the country and caused over the next couple of decades of decline in the Chinese population in the United States. It may have been that shrinking um, stock of co-ethnic customers that compelled Chinese herbalists to start casting a wider net, right, to um, look for non-Chinese patients. It's because, I, and I do see an increase in English and Spanish language advertisements after 1882. Around the same time, a new science of disease transmission based on the germ theory of disease um, of disease was becoming popular with formerly trained European and American physicians. And I'm kind of like a little bit smiling, a little bit laughing because I have some of my students. I can see your names on this, um, this call and, and you should know this history by now. So beginning in the 1890s, the American Medical Association partnered with state and local governments to standardize medical education and licensing around the germ theory of disease. Um, the American Medical, medical Association, the AMA, still with us, um, aim to monopolize the medical marketplace and drive unlicensed doctors, including Chinese herbalists, out of business. New licensing exams concentrating on medical science and pharmacology approved by AMA physicians and new laws imposed fines and jail sentences on doctors practicing without a license. So this was the moment that Chinese doctors chose to become increasingly active in the American medical marketplace. And you might be thinking to yourself, that does not seem like a good idea. That does not seem like the best time to get into the American healthcare business. And indeed, um, anti-Chinese racism prevented nearly all of them from sitting for licensing exams or, or, or being licensed by other means. 
So they practice without a license uh, and they face prosecution, they paid fines and they spent time in jail for doing so. Remember I mentioned those court cases I have, it's because they just kept getting arrested over and over for that kind of thing. So it can be really difficult to square the American consumption of Chinese rev remedies with prevalent anti-Chinese racism. Throughout the 19th century, Americans um, embraced Orientalist perceptions of Asians as backwards, as barbarous, effeminate. And these perceptions often justified exclusionary and discriminatory policies that targeted Asian nations and their immigrants to the United States. Um, such racist thinking extended to the realm of Chinese medicine. If Chinese people were primitive, then so was Chinese medical knowledge. And I see a lot of attacks on Chinese medicine and English language media that, that ridiculed their therapies as backwards or unscientific. And at the same time, and that's what these images are reflecting, public health officials unfairly identified American Chinatowns as sites of contagion and Chinese bodies as disease vectors. Yet, sci uh, scientific medicine's monopoly on the medical marketplace was really far from complete. And what I see is that Chinese herb businesses flourished in those spaces where regular doctors had not yet consolidated their control. So, so the book argues that for American patients skeptical of modern medical science, uh, that criticism of Chinese medicine could in fact constitute its allure. In the book, I detail how Chinese doctors um, advertising effectively self-orientalized. They, they self-orientalized through their advertising. They played on their non-Chinese patients' racialized expectations of Chinese culture um, and in, in, in multiple and sometimes contradictory ways. And in doing so, they basically what it boils down to is they overcame anti-Chinese racism by embracing and perpetuating anti-Chinese racism. Now my book ends um, with a history that is still unfolding. The you know, sometimes quite valiant efforts among Chinese and Chinese American scientists from the 1970s to today to deorientalize Chinese medicine by explaining its efficacy through Western style scientific uh, models and methods. Uh, biomedical scientists have been predictably slow to embrace Chinese therapies, um, and as a result, they remain largely inaccessible to kind of the, the average patient. But the deliberate speed of Western-style science is not solely to blame here. After generations of successful self-orientalizing, practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine really have very few incentives to de-orientalize. In the American medical marketplace, Chinese medicine has thrived as an alternative and not a complement to regular medicine. So that's what I have for you today. I'm happy to stay on for another half an hour and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. <coughs> to be appreciate it. I'm gonna stop sharing. <coughs> Excuse me and turn it over to the questions on the floor. Uh, I know we have people here who are practicing different forms of Chinese medicine. And we also have a very diverse group in terms of the region. I saw people from Hawaii, the West Coast, the East Coast, and everything in between. So any questions, please submit them in the chat or virtually raise your hand. From Laura Katena, hi Laura. Uh, her question is, as a practicing physician, uh, which Laura is, um, what is the current regulation of Chinese medicine sold in Chinatown and of Chinese medicine sold in China? What's the difference? Um, so we're talking about traditional herbal remedies sold in China versus sold in China, like American Chinatowns, right, is the question. Yes. So for the most part, these are not regulated, or rather they are regulated in the same way that dietary supplements are regulated, which is to say very lightly. If they're imported from China, which not all of them are, but a lot of them are, they're subject to um, like certain, I would say, spot testing to make sure that what's on the label is actually reflective of what's in the package or the bottle. Um, so, uh, so that's just to say, uh, they are not very well regulated in this country. And in China, most recently, the Chinese government has actually been rolling back 
any regulations that existed on, um, that had existed before on mass produced and exported Chinese herbal remedies. So um, there's, they're no longer kind of subject to the same um, inspections and scrutiny or uh, testing in terms of kind of meeting sort of safety standards. I, I personally do not take Chinese herbs and would only take them if I were very confident that my practitioner or my herbalist knew the sourcing of them because there's a lot of adulterated content um, distributed right now. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. Yeah. Robin Bartlett um, asks if you could identify any current medicines and or practices that have been passed down through the ages to today. Oh my gosh, like in terms of Chinese therapies, like all of yeah. them. Uh, <laughs> so acupuncture is one I think that most people are in this country are very familiar with. I actually had, let me see actually if I, on my desk I still have, um, I used to have acupuncture needles um, that uh, I actually don't even remember who gave them to me, uh, maybe an acupuncturist. So, you know, if you, so maybe I'll do like a, one of those Zoom things, if you've had acupuncture, do your um, like thumbs up. Can you do your reaction? Do you know how to do that? Have a thumbs up. The little, the little reaction tab little down reaction. Like this. Anyone who's had acupuncture? Actually, not as many thumbs up as I've seen. Okay, I see a few now that I'm sort of scrolling through the different pages. All right, but but, but not a ton. So acupuncture, if you don't know, it, it's, um, it, it is, it's a, it's a, couple thousand year old, at least, um, kind of therapy that um, uses these well, now today, these hollow core, very thin needles um, inserted in different sites, according to um, kind of uh, traditional uh, Chinese conceptions of, of anatomy and correspondences between different parts of the anatomy. And it's, it's meant to affect a whole range of, um, of kind of therapies, let's say, for different kinds of conditions. Um, so that form of acupuncture is extremely popular now. It was popularized in the 1970s, um, but it actually, um, those really thin needles were not, are not ancient. Um, in prior to about 1900, if you did acupuncture, it was really much more like a minor surgery. So um, they would actually deliberately like open a channel, like let blood flow. Um, they had tiny, acupuncture needles were more like tiny scalpels or tiny um, retractors. And the um, folks that I study, the herbalists, really considered that to be a very low class form of medicine. So acupuncture, you know, it's something that we think of as being this very ancient tradition, but it actually gets totally revised and reinvented in the 20th century, um, really largely because because of industrialization, the ability to make needles that don't cause you to need to have your, like, your skin ripped open, right, for, for, uh, for this effect to work. Um, but there are just lots. I mean, cupping is another one that got very popular because Michael Phelps and Gwyneth Paltrow kind of appeared with these um, circular bruises. They look like giant circular hickeys all over their body. Um, cupping is also, or, and it's related to another ancient therapy called moxibustion, which is kind of the, the burning of certain botanical medicines on or very near to the skin. Um, you know, I mean, I could kind of go on. Herbalism is obviously very ancient. Um, there's lots of talismanic healing that I think people still, still practice sort of superstitious forms of, of self-healing. Thank you. As someone who is terrified of needles, that was... They're very thin oh. now. You don't, <laughs> to, you don't have to be afraid. Yeah, they, they're very, they don't, and you don't bleed. Thank you. Uh, Kendra asks if there are uh, any Chinese herbs that have been explored by Western medicine, so perhaps explored as, as treatments um, uh, in the U.S. or perhaps what insurance companies would consider uh, covering? Because right. So, so there's sort of those are sort of two different questions. So I will say that um, what I found in my research is that really um, Chinese, uh, let's say, materia medica more generally, so things that are botanical or zoological or mineral in origin. Um, have been part of American pharmacology since the beginning, right? So we have to imagine this, uh, you know, the early modern world, right, was really um, kind of one big medicine chest, right? So European exploration was very, of new worlds, was very often motivated by the 
desire to do prospecting for new medical remedies. And as a result, right, um, there's this sort of global market for medical goods and really no um, differentiation between, oh, well, this is grown in North America and that's grown in Asia. I mean, people were and still are very ecumenical about the sourcing of their, um, of their medicines. So, so that's just to say um, Western style medical science has always been sampling quite freely from this kind of global buffet of, of um, medicines. Um, but more recently in the 20th century and kind of increasingly, um, there has been a large scale, well, let's say um, more rigorous, let me say more rigorous uh, clinical and laboratory experiments uh, associated with uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So some very famous ones are a, rec a recent Nobel Prize winner who found the active agent in, um, and now it's, the name has completely gone out of my head, but um, basically a, a, an anti-malarial herb. If someone has it, put it in the chat because it's just left my head, but you know, uh, did not, oh, did not communicate clearly. I, I, that's, I, um, so this, the, Anyway, so um, there was a recent Nobel Prize winner who won because she located the active compound in um, this traditional Chinese herb that's used to treat malaria. Then the other one, um, ephedra, is another one that has been studied pretty extensively and been studied for actually almost 100 years at this point. Another traditional Chinese um, herbal or a compound that's used in Chinese herbal remedies that's actually been proven to be unsafe. Um, it, 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 for people with heart problems, taking ephedra can be fatal. So, I mean, there's, there are tons of, of kind of relatively recent studies um, that, uh, that have been trying to probe and isolate and understand um, the, active, uh, the active ingredients in these uh, traditional Chinese herbs, yeah. Tamara, there's a good follow-up to that from Jonathan, who's asked um, if there's been any American scientific research or clinical trials that have validated any Chinese medicines or practices. Yeah, there, there have. And I think someone put something from the NIH in there. The NIH has a special division. Uh, there's a link in the chat, sorry, from NIH. Um, the, the NIH has a division that is dedicated toward funding this type of research. And so we do have some... Um, some studies of traditional Chinese herbal remedies that show efficacy um, a, a, in a sort of um, statistically significant way. We also know that certain, that, or uh, let's say the NIH has determined that acupuncture is, um, through clinical trials, has determined that the acupuncture is effective in treating certain kinds of pain conditions. So, um, so let's um, think like certain kinds of, um, uh, chronic pain conditions, or uh, it has been shown to be an effective treatment for certain types of, of post-operative pain or pain associated with chemotherapy. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's narrow, right? And, and, I, can, and I do, in the, in the last part of the book, kind of get into the challenges of proving the efficacy of traditional Chinese therapies through Western-style medical paradigms. Um, but it does happen, and it's been happening increasingly, I think, because of, uh, well, probably many things, but one of the things is the increasing cost of healthcare, and that um, sometimes some people believe that these therapies are both effective in terms of their therapeutic benefit, but also cost effective. And so there's been, I would say, in the last 20, 25 years, a major push to, um, to you know, effectively to translate these traditional Chinese therapies into a language that Western style medical scientists can understand. Michael uh, would, like us to, would like you to talk a little bit about uh, appropriating Chinese medicine. So he asks, can you speak to the issue regarding non-Chinese practitioners appropriating Chinese medicine? What's the issue there? So meaning like cultural appropriation. So I think it's that, in that yeah, vein, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I think that this is maybe a question that should, like the answer should start with, well, what is cultural appropriation, right? Because um, I think we have to start with a sense that, or maybe implicit in the question, Michael, is a feeling that non-Chinese people should perhaps not be practicing Chinese medicine, that um, Chinese medical knowledge and practices is somehow 
belongs to a culture um, is sort of the, the proprietary right of a certain set of people and not another's. Um, so cultural appropriation is as a phrase that um, typically applies to uh, a person uh, essentially um, irresponsibly or maybe in an exploitative way taking the culture of another set of people and turning it to their own advantage, profiting from it or getting famous because of it, um, not giving that other culture the respect that they're due. So certainly we can look in the past and see plenty of non-Chinese people who dress up as Chinese scholars, who don the, the robes and the cap, who paint their faces, who um, make themselves appear to be Chinese or who in their advertising are kind of propagating um, and promulgating uh, stereotypical images of Chinese that were used to also demean them and caricaturize and, and belittle them. Well, there are plenty of examples of that. There are also plenty of examples of people of non-Chinese descent who are genuinely um, engage in respectful study of and use of and, and um, practice of traditional Chinese medicine. So I think there's there's room for both things to be to happen and to be true. Question from Aaron um, asking about uh, how Chinese herbalism is affecting today's biotechnology drug developments and whether you see a continuing adoption of Chinese herbalism in modern drug therapies. Oh my gosh, so many major pharmaceutical companies would love to find a way to you know, to profit off of traditional herbal medicines. There are a couple things that I think about this, and this is, you know, again, I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm not a, a future pro prognosticator, uh, prognosticator of the future, but, you know, one, like, there's patent law, and there's not a lot of room for patenting these traditional herbal remedies, so there's a sort of limitation for big companies in terms of what they can expect to um, to get out of these kinds of things. Um, but then I think the other side of that, sorry, now I've kind of lost my train of thought, but so, so there's the, the patent issue, which is a problem. Um, but there's also, um, oh gosh, sorry, I think we're gonna have to come back to it. I got distracted by the chat appearing down at the bottom of my screen and then I lost my train of thought. Um, big pharmaceutical companies, I mean, I, I do think that there's a, a huge um, interest in figuring out how to do this and how to profit off of the huge global market for this kind of thing. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not going away for sure. And if anything, um, there's sort of more energy behind, um, behind, yeah, uh, sort of exploring these untapped markets. I mean, the Chinese have a monopoly over it right now, but that's not to say in the future um, they won't have competitors for it. And I had something else to say on this matter, but it left my brain, so we can go on. <laughs> I know what you mean when that chat starts going. So I know, it's really like hard. I know. Um, Cecilia asks if you can address any attitude changes for using Chinese medicines from endangered animals. Any oh my gosh, I hope it's changing. Jeez Louise. Um, you know, I, I, so this is like tiger's bones, rhino horns, pangolin scales. I mean, I, I don't think we have any reason to believe that um, in a global sense that's declining right now, but I wish it would. And there are plenty of nonprofit groups. There's one I work with called Animals Asia, or have worked with in the past called Animals Asia, that is really trying to um, do a lot of not just awareness raising, but actually going to patient consumers and thinking about how to reform behavior. So that is one thing that, that big like pharmaceutical companies can get involved with is synthetic substitutes for traditional herbal remedies. Um, and, and, um, and that's really what nonprofits who are concerned with, with endangered species have been trying to go for to show that, or to convince communities who are accustomed to using, let's say um, sun and moon bear gallbladder juice, right, vial, um, to, that, to convince them that the synthetic alternative is just as effective. Um, but I, I got to say, I'm, I've been pretty pessimistic about, about their success. I, I mean, these, these cultures are so deeply rooted. I, I hope it does change, though. I mean, gosh. 
Uh, so Jill Stark is on and she submitted a question. Uh, Jill is from China, not a lot of people know, but she was actually raised in China before coming to Scripps uh, in the US. And she asked, how did you become interested in Chinese medicine uh, outside of maybe your experience in Oregon? Yeah, so I am half Chinese. My family um, immigrated in the late 19th century. They were merchants and they were excluded. They were not subject to Chinese exclusion as a result. Um, and I did not grow up consuming Chinese medicine. Um, my grandmother, though, who was born in, in San Francisco in 1918, um, did. Uh, she used it kind of interchangeably with Western style um, medicine. And um, I think when I was kind of hunting around, this is my second book project, when I was kind of hunting around for a second book, um, I knew the types of history I liked to write. I knew like what kind of research I liked to do. I hadn't really written about Chinese people in my first book, although they make a kind of cameo appearance at one point. Um, but I just, I wanted to tell stories more about the people that my grandmother grew up with, people that she knew in San Francisco Chinatown. Um, and it just, I, I do not descend from herbalists, but if you are Chinese American, you know herbalists. So, you know, it wasn't hard. Once I started talking to family members, they're like, oh, you know, Uncle Ed's dad was an herbalist in Visalia or, you know, cousin Ron's friend Calvin grew up in Oakland and his dad had an apothecary in Santa Rosa, right? So it just kind of like flowed from a lot of family conversations. And um, my grandmother did try to give me, I talk about this actually in the, in the acknowledgments of the book, my grandmother did give me Chinese herbs at one point. And I just, I, I, it was, they're steeped in a tea. It's very customary to steep them in a tea. So I drank the tea and I threw up <laughs> immediately. And she goes, that's how you know it's working. So I did not feel better, by the way. I did not feel better. I think, I think Jill liked that. I can see Jill, <laughs> Jill laughing over there. Thanks, Jill, for the question. Um, Kendra would like you to talk a little bit about women's health, um, whether it's, um, uh, fertility, abortions, gynecology, uh, just to speak to some of the uh, research either you've done or you've seen on women's health in Chinese medicine. Yeah, this for me was one of the most exciting findings. Now, when I started writing this book, I, like, I was living in Oregon. I was working with um, people at the uh, Oregon, Oregon College of Oriental Medicine. So, um, so uh, back when, when I started it, a lot of what I was learning about Chinese medicine was coming through them. And what they told me among other things, was you will never find a Chinese doctor performing abortions because that's counter to the philosophy of life giving that the Chinese herbalists believe in. So I was like, fine, 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 whatever. And then I find out they are acting as abortionists and sometimes therapeutic abortions, right? Sometimes giving um, women herbs and um, it, at a time when abortion was illegal, um, giving them herbs so that they uh, spontaneously abort and sometimes actually doing surgical abortions with like uterine sounds and, and like, a, like a dilation and curatage type um, procedure. So this to me was like one of the more exciting findings was to, um, to discover that they were doing this. It sort of opened up this whole world of the ways in which Chinese doctors um, intervened in uh, women's health. You know, so at a time when, when abortion was illegal, they were providing abortions. At a time when women, um, a lot of conditions that we, that we would not deal with surgically now or that we could deal with, with surgically um, very safely, so like a prolapsed uterus or something, for, for a lot of women in the progressive era, having something like that, having a, a, a tumor on their uterus, for example, would have basically been a death sentence. I mean, surgery at the turn of the 20th century, surgery, you had a 50-50 chance of dying in surgery. So what I see ended up finding were a lot of women going to Chinese doctors when they had these conditions that, um, that were considered to be treatable only by surgery. They would go to the Chinese doctor and they would say, please shrink my tumor with herbs or please um, fix my prolapsed uterus with, with herbs. There was a lot of this sort of um, these kind of ways in which Chinese doctors could provide a service for women that felt safer, but still possibly effective. And, and I think that for, for women, for many women, Chinese doctors were a kind of refuge from, you know, uh, the fear of the knife, right? It's actually a good segue into the next question we have coming in from Jan Lee Wong. 
Uh, in your research, did you come across any information about some early Chinese immigrants being afraid of American hospitals? Perhaps that, that fear of Western medicine and maybe the fear that hospitals are places of death. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, um, and, and not just hospitals, but kind of all Western style medical science. So vaccination is another one that Chinese, a lot of Chinese immigrants, even though there was vaccination in China, um, smallpox vaccination had been in China for, um, you know, well over, gosh, well over 50 years, if not longer, by the time Chinese immigrants started coming to this country en masse. Um, but there's a lot of suspicion amongst Chinese immigrants that non-Chinese doctors were poisoning them or were um, otherwise committing malpractice. But there's also a lot of um, experimentation. So I find um, records of Chinese workers, uh, you know, uh, in the archaeological records of Chinese work sites in the Sierras. So people who are mostly working on the railroad, but they could also be mining or they could be um, otherwise working in these kind of remote places. Archaeologists have found all the different imaginable remedies in those places. So certainly, um, I saw in the chat someone mentioned ginkgo. Certainly, Chinese were were grow they were actually propagating ginkgo in um, mining sites. They were also buying um, indigenous medicines, so herbal medicines from local California Indian tribes. They were buying bottles of um, kind of Western style proprietary or patent remedies. So there was there was distrust, but there was also a kind of openness and experimentation and willingness to experiment with with new medicines as well. There's no kind of like uniform Chinese immigrant experience in that regard. You mentioned ginkgo, and it wasn't a question, but it was a comment early in the chat from Elisa. Uh, she's a chemist working for a pharmaceutical company, uh, actually focusing on traditional Chinese herbal medicine, and she said it's really tough to get clinical trials going when you can't can't patent ginkgo. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that, would you? I think it's just kind of what I said is if there's not a lot of, um, of space in American patent law or maybe internationally, you know, the sort of set of laws that govern these things to um, get a kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a well, it's a patent. It's a the, the kind of uh, secure uh, the right to develop um, these traditional herbal remedies. They're, they're, um, they're not proprietary compounds. They're, they just, yeah, they're just not covered, I think. And probably someone else in this chat can describe that in better detail than I can. Um, that's, yeah, I don't, I don't have much more to say. It's like patenting corn or something. Mm -hmm. um, Jenny uh, mentioned uh, most recently in the chat that there are various variations uh, to traditional Chinese medicine, especially Taiwan, Korean. Oh, sure, yeah. What, and that was the end of her comment, but it made me really think of a question, Tamara, that uh, what, where does Chinese, Chinese medicine start and end? Is it appropriate to call Korean variations Chinese medicine with a Korean twist, or is it truly like Korean Eastern medicine? Where, yeah, where's the delineation? Question. It's a great question because um, Chinese medicine is diasporic. You know, it, it, um, it has influenced Korean medicine. It has influenced medicine in Southeast Asia, in Japan. Um, certainly Taiwan has its own flavor. Even, you know, within China, there's this sort of major rupture with the communist revolution where Chinese medicine undergoes um, a kind of massive reinvention. Um, I should probably start just by saying that Chinese me medicine, it's an umbrella term for a lot of different therapies whose, whose origins are sometimes way back like 2000 years ago in China. And Chinese people traveled and their knowledge traveled and it mingled with um, practices that were indigenous to the Korean Peninsula, practices that were indigenous to, you know, the areas that we now think of as like Vietnam and Laos. And so you can kind of go many places in this world and find variations of Chinese medicine. Um, you know, what makes it Chinese? Well, there are kind of a few different principles. So yin and yang is a Chinese principle that, that or it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of set, a concept that develops in, um, in China and then becomes a formative of medical philosophies, medical knowledge systems um, that travel elsewhere. Also wuxing, which is this, the sort of idea that there are these sort of five phases to the human body. Certain theories of anatomy are uniquely Chinese and then travel out from China. So you can sort of trace these 
like intellectual um, fence posts um, that that sort of form the perimeter around what we might think of what we might define as Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. Great. Last question from Jill Stark before we wrap up today. What courses do you offer at CMC? What are you teaching? Uh, right now, I am teaching uh, human health and disease in American history, and I am teaching the American West, which is um, my, my original area of expertise, my, where I got my PhD um, a long time ago. Um, what else do I teach? I, I think I count pretty much as um, an early Americanist here at CMC because my area of expertise is the 19th century. But at a small liberal arts college, you end up teaching a little bit of everything. So I do offer courses on um, early American capitalism, which goes up through the Gilded Age. I also offer an Asian American history survey that, that comes all the way up to the 21st century. Um, and I teach the American Civil War. I teach FHS, Nature and Society, and I teach um, U.S. environmental history as well. So a, a lot of different things. I don't. I never get bored. I'm always changing my hat. You know, we have uh, just one more minute. I thought maybe it'd be fun for you to talk a little bit about the history department. I think it's come. Um, it's 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 certainly grown over the last decade. Oh yeah. Um, and you have a very strong online presence. So maybe just a little bit about the history department at CMC. Absolutely. Well, history, uh, if you ask any of the students, history is the unsung, you know, gem. I don't know if a, a gem can't sing. That was a bad mixed metaphor. But we are the gem of CMC. Um, I, I highly encourage everyone to check out our YouTube channel. We, over the summer, in response to um, the global protests for racial, um, uh, against uh, kind of for social justice and against racial violence, um, we decided to launch a YouTube channel in which members of our faculty are offering different explainers and kind of short videos, um, trying to reach out to students to talk about uh, questions and concepts that they might have as they watch the news and look at their Facebook feed and their Insta feed and, and are thinking about these issues of social justice and racial violence. Um, we have a great faculty, 14 people strong, covering most of the world and most of human history. Um, and it's a really exciting place to be. A lot of really dynamic scholarship and great teachers and nice, nice people. So um, yeah, check us out on YouTube. Well, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I hope you join us for future programming. We have Professor Henry Cole, who is a poet who just published, uh, speaking with us next week. We have the Athenaeum program from the, the chairman of, of Disney Film um, tonight from the Athenaeum, and lots more programming coming up in the coming week. So thank you all again for your support. Thank you for joining us for this hour, and we hope to see you very soon. I'm going to unmute everybody. Feel free to say hi, bye, thank you. Uh, good to see you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Very good. It was. It was great. Tell us what you're stitching, Jill. Oh, a nice needlepoint pillow for someone up here. Oh, very good. Okay. Nice.